welcome to the BOF for our grouping working group that if, if formed will probably not be called SCONE. Um, <laughs> but we've got a, a, a pretty, um, we got a pretty packed agenda here. We've got a, a, a bunch of people. And so I think with that, we are going to jump right into it. Yeah. Once again, we're obligated to remind people of uh, the terms under which we participate here. Uh, this covers a bunch of stuff. Um, all on the slide. Uh, I'd like to draw your attention to the intellectual property aspects of this. Uh, there are disclosure requirements in that regard, and also the code of conduct, which basically it boils down to uh, treating everyone with respect. Uh, any questions, come talk to us or uh, anyone in the leadership. So today uh, we have this short introduction uh, Colin and I will go over the status of things uh, since we last met in Brisbane, uh, the things that have happened since then. Uh, Marcus will give us a brief overview of the, the problem statement to refresh everyone on, on where things are at there. And um, Matt will go through in more detail what has happened since uh, ITF 119 and the, the sort of questions that came up during that and the progress that's been made on those. Uh, we will then look at the charter that has been proposed in some detail. Uh, that will be reading from slides for the most part. And uh, then we will discuss that charter. Uh, the expectation here, is, well, the hope here is that we have a good conversation about what's in that charter and the scope of the work that's involved here. And uh, we will answer a number of questions and we'll, we'll get to the questions at the end. Does anyone want to suggest improvements to this agenda? Excellent. Take right, that's, no. <laughs> right, so uh, we had a boff at the last IETF meeting. Uh, that was a good discussion on a number of points. Uh, it was clear that there were some open questions at the end of that, that meeting. And um, there has been quite a lot of work since then on addressing those questions. Uh, you'll observe that there is quite a number of drafts uh, related to this work. Uh, there is no expectation that you've read all of those documents, although it would help if you have an understanding of broad uh, sort of topics in there that this was, I think, uh, listed in meeting materials at some point. Uh, if you're not reading them, uh, if you haven't read them, I would suggest uh, taking a, a look at the abstracts while we, while we get through some of the early material. Wow, someone turned the lights on. Uh, these were the questions that we ended the uh, discussion in 119 with. Uh, these are not necessarily the open questions that we've made progress on, but these were the sort of things that we're talking about uh, out, of, out of the end of the last meeting. That is things like um, how we do discovery, what does signal look like, how's it propagated, uh, what are the privacy properties that are associated with that, um, does this have any, have any potential to un undermine things like uh, network neutrality for whatever that means. Um, and how would this work in a multipath context? And how, what's the inter interrelation with things like ECN? A uh, number of questions along those lines. Uh, Matt will go into that in some more detail. All right, shall we? All right. So before I uh, jump into uh, the overview thing, the goals for this session are pretty straightforward. We want to ask a very simple set of questions. Uh, is there a problem here that we want to solve? Uh, do we actually know how to solve that problem in a very general sense? And do we have people here that are interested in doing that work? Do you think we can be successful at the ITF in achieving that goal? And that's it. 
that is, that, these are essentially the questions we'll be asking at the end of the session. Keep them in mind. Uh, it is our hope that we can uh, get to a positive answer on these things, but uh, that will depend on the next one. So Marcus, you want to tell us what we're here for? Do you want me to drive slides? All right, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Marcus Zilar. I will do a very brief uh, overview of the problem statement and kind of why we're here and what we're trying to solve. So in case you haven't seen this before, this is just a little short overview. So the, uh, it's a common practice in many networks today that you do kind of what we call ABR video shaping. So this is a way of um, managing traffic by, by throttling or shaping certain traffic flows that tend to be adaptive so that you reduce the volume that these flows uh, consume. This is done to kind of manage load. There's also common practice to kind of use this mechanism to differentiate between subscription tiers and so on. These shapers are deployed typically as like token bucket filters of some sorts that either delays packets as in shaping or drops packets like a policer. Oftentimes you configure this player to be, or sorry, this shaper to be uh, trying to force a video player to adapt its quality target to some specific bitrate, like two megabits per second. Next slide, please. So uh, why is this done? Well, because a uh, common class of traffic is what we call uh, adaptive bitrate video. Um, so this, uh, this is a scheme of, of delivering streaming, streaming video to, to clients where, where the client is continuously uh, estimating the capacity of the network selecting an appropriate video quality that kind of ensures a smooth playback. So you continuously measure your own buffer, you measure your network capacity, and you decide which video quality I'm going to select for my next video segment. So this works fine. Real-time video has similar properties as well often, like trial and error to kind of optimize uh, or try to find the optimal bit rate. Next slide, please. So with shaping, uh, the network then kind of forces the, tries to force a client into a specific range of quality by uh, detecting the flow, shaping that flow to a certain bitrate, sort of so that, that the player <clears throat> so that the player adapts to to that uh, bitrate. This can be done under congestion to kind of uh, manage the load, or it can be you know as part of a subscription plan, etc. So in this particular case, the desired outcome could be that you want the ABR to select a two megabit per second video track. Yeah. Next slide. Uh, so this works, uh, but there are problems with this. Like the ABR schemes, they don't converge very quickly, so this can lead to poor user experience. They might be trialing for some higher quality. The shaper kicks in, and then it takes time for it to converge to, to find a good, proper quality. Um, also, this, these kind of shapers and policers interact interestingly with congestion controllers, uh, who are typically more suited to kind of classic queuing uh, mechanisms. So you can have you know, shapers that momentarily let through large bursts of traffic, and then they kind of uh, shrink the available bandwidth for some time, and it can be, be very difficult for a congestion controller to kind of adapt and find a suitable rate. Um, so the problem with all this is that the limit imposed by these uh, shapers and policers is artificial. So uh, while it can kind of support this instantaneously, high bandwidth, sometimes it then needs to compensate for that. So you, you get problems and you, it's hard to converge and get good quality of your video pretty much. So next slide, please. Um, so what we're proposing here is to instead explicitly inform the, the video application about what bitrate cap is applied in this network. So with, a, with an explicit information sent as a network property, the application can adapt on the application layer itself. It doesn't need to use the kind of congestion control limits to determine what the optimal rate is. So you can select a quality track based on this, uh, on this explicit information. So we kind of moved from being congestion limited to being application limited. Then you can, may or may not decide to disable shaping completely in your network. That depends on the deployment, but it, this is kind of what we're trying to solve. Make this thing transparent and explicit so you get better, better performance in these cases. And yeah, this is the short recap of this problem statement. Okay, any questions here, clarification? Uh, we saw last time we met, some performance numbers of what this, what this might look like, but 
Um, that was from a, from a trial. Um, Matt, you want to come up and give us the next one? Thanks, Marcus. Hello, everyone. I'm Matt Joris. Uh, and I'm going to talk about, as Martin said, some questions that were raised both at IETF 119 and subsequently, and some of the discussion, solutions, et cetera, that have taken place since then. Next slide. So this is our kind of current status overview. So Martin mentioned this, but there's been a lot of discussion. This discussion has been split across numerous places, uh, both directly on the SAD CDN mailing list, which was uh, the original name for this work, um, but also on GitHub, where we've been working on the charter, and there's been many issues and discussions on those issues. And as Martin mentioned, there's uh, eight drafts with Scone Pro in the name. Several of these are specifically focused on the questions that were uh, identified after the last boff. And so those, this, this presentation, we're not going to be going over those drafts, but uh, they are there for, uh, for anyone that wants to consume that information. Uh, and then, of course, we've been working a lot on a proposed charter. So, and that charter has changed significantly. Um, uh, it's changed probably most significantly since the last boff, but even more recently in the last few weeks, there's been a lot of uh, honing in on certain ideas, uh, removing certain things, and a lot of clarifications. Um, so we're not going over that. Th this presentation is not going over the charter or the PRs or anything like that. We're just uh, talking about a higher level. Um, and also, we want to identify any open questions that we've missed as part of this. So, uh, and that will be, we'll be able to discuss those later. Next slide. Okay, so one of the biggest questions is, is one about scope. And this is one where we've been really honing in on certain things. So the focus now on the charter is on network to host signaling and also on all networks, not just mobile. So it would apply to all networks where this could be relevant because we believe that that is, it is relevant to all networks. And there's also a list of out of scope items in the charter explicitly enumerated. Um, and we will be seeing that later as we go over the charter. And so that was something that was clearly needed at after the last boff is that, you know, having a specific list of things that, you know, this is not about. Next slide. Okay, so extensibility. Um, there were, many discussions and questions about like we have this goal but what could this also be used for uh, and so this work now as reflected in the charter is really trying to be very specific about this is targeting abr video that's carried in quick connections and the network properties that we're talking about are specifically related to throughput and that's we're currently worded this as maximum available or achievable throughput and as Marcus's presentation noted, this is supposed to reflect similar information to what's being encoded in the network already uh, when a shaper or a policer is used. So uh, this is basically exposing that information and only that information, uh, not other things and anything else that would could be extended like is not in the current charter. Next slide. Privacy. So. Uh, this is obviously an extremely important topic. Um, whenever you're exchanging information and that information is emerging from the network and ending up at an endpoint, uh, there's obviously a very natural concern about what are the privacy implications of this work. Uh, and so right now, the idea with Scone Pro, as, as outlined in the charter, is that it is opt-in and it's opt-in from a client. So this is a client uh, a client initiates this, and the information that's flowing is from the network to that client. So the only information that's really coming in the other direction is the information that, hey, this is ABR video. But what's the key thing to note about this is that this information is already there today. It has to be there in some form because operators need to know what 
from what flows through their networks are video because it's just an absolute need of their operations because of how uh, how important managing video load is on their networks. And so today, you know, those are identified with numerous mechanisms. The most common is you know being able to look at the SNI or something like that. But the important point is that they they already know this information, and this is so. Scone Pro is not really introducing new things. It's just making it more explicit so that the client is opting in to say, hey, this, this is ABR video. Um, tell, please tell me so, what you were going to do with it. Um, that being said, um, we assume that privacy analysis and thinking about this would be a core aspect of the working group's activities. Uh, and so it would obviously inform any protocol that comes out of this work. Next slide. So somewhat related, but uh, really a different topic is security and trust. And so anytime you're exchanging information from the network, the natural question arises is, uh, how can I trust this information? Um, so if that's a very natural question. Um, but so one thing to think about with this is, can you actually do it? So what, what security properties can you achieve? And so if, we, if you look back at the a proof of concept we did at the last BOF, some of that is addressed in that proof of concept of, of the broad strokes of what we think are possible in this space. Um, but another thing to, that we've been thinking about more is what kinds of things could be problematic here in terms of like, what do you really need to trust? And the thing that is most important is that Scrum Pro itself is optional and advisory. This isn't something we think are, is a required thing for a video flow. Um, and so there's any given client does not have to use it. And so it can choose to ignore it and choose to trust it as it sees fit. Um, and so that's, so that's uh, true whenever the client wants to initiate this or, and choose to use it or not. Next slide. And then, of course, we have the question of incentives. So why would different things choose to use this system? Uh, so the most important incentive to consider is the that of the, the user, the human behind this thing, so the behind the connection. Uh, and so that's the people that use video on the internet. And the reason that they would be benefit from this is because uh, shaping and policing of video traffic fundamentally leads to poor outcomes for that video. Um, and we've been able to show and we really believe that you can improve the quality of experience of that video by not having the network shape and or police that traffic and instead having this explicit cooperation. Uh, the other thing that is important for why a standard here is important rather than just, you know, unilaterally trying to uh, have these sorts of agreements between certain content providers and certain uh, internet providers is that by having a standard that's used continuously and is a property of networks, uh, any, any smaller video provider or one that is not a current dominant player has an equal opportunity to provide this to their users. And that fundamentally means that, you know, and a user can switch between video, video heavy products uh, that they want to consume and not have a worse experience on others simply because uh, they're a smaller video provider does not have the resources to have these relationships where they strike agreements about, you know, uh, video policy on the internet. By having a standard, you know, they just need to opt into that standard and then they get the same benefits. Uh, for carriers, the main incentive here is that these traffic shaping systems are expensive in many ways. They're computationally intensive. Uh, they're difficult to maintain. They're difficult to configure. Uh, the products that they are targeting, these video products are moving targets. Uh, they change year to year. They can change month to month. And trying to ensure good user experience for their users while also meeting their own uh, benefits or what they're trying to achieve in managing their networks or their businesses is very difficult. Um, so we think that this is one of those cases where there are actually relatively aligned incentives between all of these all of these parties, assuming we restrict we have some restrictions around you know how what kind of information is exchanged. Next slide. So this is always a tricky tricky topic, uh, net neutrality. Um, 
partially because it's not really a well-defined single thing, but it's been raised and naturally it should be raised. Um, and we have a draft about this, but fundamentally we do not think that Scone Pro is really changing anything with regards to net neutrality. So we are responding, that Scone Pro is a response to existing practices that are varied throughout different markets throughout the world. And it's basically offering an alternative to some of those practices, but does not really change the core of what those practices are doing. And that is something that's, you know, the subject of regulations and in individual markets and uh, a standard protocol in this space that is chain is exchanging this limited bit of information is not really changing the net neutrality story. Next slide. All right, that's it. That's it. Okay. And I think right now, are we just doing clarifying questions on these topics rather than going yeah. into the questions themselves? I mean, it, it, we've got lots of time to, you, you know, this is, this is our conclusions that, that are led to the current version of the charter. We'll have lots of time to discuss uh, the, the charter and implications of that going forward, but certainly want to take clarifying questions on this right now. We have a few, so. Uh, Martin Duke, Google. So the um, must, the requirement that the client must be ABR, is that intended to be in the charter? And if so, do you plan to have like an enforcement mechanism for that? Or is that just, or is that not the intent? So yes, it is in the charter. Um, enforcement mechanism, I don't think we've really thought about that because it's somewhat unknowable whether it's true. Um, like, so in general with this, with this, uh, the trust model here, we expect in reality, there's a degree of like trust, but verify. Um, so it, it's, it's advisory information, right? So if, if like a client is lying about what it is, or, uh, or for example, a network is lying about its limits, like, yeah, all of that is possible because there's no way to prevent it, but there are humans that run these things and the humans have their own ways of digging into what's really going on. And then the humans talk to each other and, you know, figure it out. That's kind of our expectation. And that's what happens today um, with these kinds of the systems. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, I think so. At the risk of not clarifying, it sounds like there isn't actually a privacy exposure here. If there's, if there's nothing that prevents a client from, you know, uh, using, say, uh, uh, ECH and, and saying, I'm ABR, but he's not actually ABR. Right, thank yeah. you. Just a second, Martin, I missed, missed your point on that. Uh, it, so today on the network, there's, there's, I, I mean, so you're saying there's, there's nothing, there's no technical mechanism to prevent a client from ignoring this data that we're going to provide them? No, no, uh, the opposite. So uh, Matt's comment was that there was a, a potential privacy exposure in that the client communicates that it is ABR. Um, now, granted, there are, there are, there are, right. there, there are, uh, ABR video. Now, granted, there are currently mechanisms that operators can use to detect that. So maybe, you know, yeah. and as the current state of play, it's, it's a wash. Uh, obviously, there's all these things like ECH coming down the pike, which might change that, that scheme. But if there's no enforcement mechanism, then the client is not, in fact, communicating that it is ABR video necessarily. It could be something, some other application entirely. Uh, and... Thus, there's no privacy exposure. Got it. Now, just remember, clarifications, questions are in place. <laughs> um, Lars Lager, Mozilla. So, so uh, quick statement of the presentations, Matt and also Mark, this were great. Uh, thank you. So they're highly polished and easy to follow. Good job. Uh, the question is, um, it's a little bit the inverse of Martin. So you said earlier that, um, you know, the. Uh, there wouldn't be a privacy concern because the clients are signals, you know, I'm doing AVR for this, but you know, not, no other information flows up, like, you know, what video stream this is or so on. I'm actually wondering sort of, does any subscriber information get exposed? So, so would the operator be able to, to be able to decline uh, responding to a request and, and could therefore the operator decide to only, um, you know, offer this feature to customers who pay extra? So, the intention right now is that this would not explicitly have subscriber information in it. Um, whether the information exchange implicitly communicates subscriber information is like the same thing happens today. 
Now, and to answer your question about could an operator just choose to not for certain flows? Yes, the, just like today, they can choose to not shape certain flows. Um, if they are like, I'm just going to not do uh, Scone Pro for this flow versus this flow, they similarly not shape this flow versus this right. flow. Not shaping makes it better for the user. And, yes. and this would also make it better. So you, you basically, you, be, you have the ability to exclude a client from getting the better service that this, I agree with you, offers. That's sort of more interesting. So I'd be, I would like if the system sort of didn't have the ability for an operator to, to sort of distinguish users into buckets. I think that's sort of the high level point. Okay. Uh, QMISL MPIN, I have two questions. Mm -hmm. The first is, um, you've talked mostly about ABR. Is that the only thing that's been considered or are other network properties um, yeah, are the, is, is the charter just about ABR or are, are other network properties also considered? Have, has any work been done on anything other than ABR? And um, uh, yeah, I'll let you answer that first. The charter exclusively targets ABR video over quick, where ABR is things like video playback, but also potentially, say, like RTC video play video calls over quick things like that but has other work been done like maybe thought work there's nothing explicitly in the charter or in any document about other potential properties okay i think that's a limitation that shouldn't be there but uh my second question is does is this request for information explicitly linked to a traffic flow or does the client Say, hey, what 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 video bitrate can I do? And then independent, and then there's no link between asking about the network properties and saying, um, and and the actual flow. So if if um, would would there be a possibility for the network operator to disable the shaper for a specific flow or add a different shaper onto a flow because the client asked? about the network properties for that flow? So to answer your question, uh, the expectation right now is that it would be associated with a flow. So a given quick connection through, so you're, yeah. at, you're asking for information about this quick connection that carries ABR video, give me the properties for that, please. So it would be possible to differentiate, like you could add a different, um, flow rate onto Netflix or Disney Plus. That would be theoretically possible for an operator is, to do, okay. yes. Quite a question for people to think about that. Is that something we want to allow? I'm not expecting an answer right now. Hi, what's on line, Akamai? Uh, my question, is it as, can we see this basically as a mechanism to advertise to any flow what the bandwidth constraints are on scales beyond the lifetime of congestion control? Or is that too generalized? So we're going to talk about that a little bit when we go over the charter. Um, in the One of the out of scope items is explicitly that this is not a replacement to congestion control. Uh, specifically, this is more application layer information. So in this case, that application is explicitly ABR video. Um, so while an operator may choose to send this signal based on some notion it has of congestion, it's not meant to be congestion in the sense of like, this flow is experiencing congestion. Please have your congestion controller respond to it. This is a higher level signal. That's, but we have, we're going to talk about that later in the charter. Uh, does that answer your question? Uh, I think we'll talk about it later. But it's a very good answer for what, what you're thinking. Uh, Thomas Eckert. Yeah, I think you partially implicitly just answered uh, my question, but I, would, I, I really don't know what ABR means because I think, you know, everybody who runs such a service thinks that whatever he does is ABR. Um, and so I think there's a very wide spectrum and we should be, please be very uh, descriptive of that, right? Because there is a big difference between, let's say, the low latency in such a video conference, as you said, and then some, you know, over the top video, which is happy to have 10 second play out. And uh, I think whatever these other distinguishing properties are that we do want to capture within, 
um, uh, the, the work would be best not to be, you know, pointed to some abbreviation that people may think differently about, but explicitly in the charter. Okay. Yeah. Long, I mean, long short latency, whatever these, these factors are. Sure. Just to be clear, the, our definition of ABR is rather uh, general insofar as it literally means that a client is able to switch between different video encodings as part of a given video playback or video experience. No, understood. But then you've been doing, let's say, or I, as one reader, has been doing video playout with 10 seconds and think everybody does that. And then people come up and say, no, we want to have very uh, low latency, right? And then people disagree on whether both of these things should be in, in, in scope, right? So let's let's make clear that we don't have a mis disagreement on what it means. Sure. Hello, this is Luis Contreras from Telefonica. I, I have a, a question and one comment. The question is about privacy. You you have focused the privacy from the perspective of the of the user, but I was wondering what about the privacy from the perspective of the provider? So somehow. The, the information that could be exposed could be used, uh, I mean, for different purposes. So probably we, we need to also to do, have some emphasis on the privacy from the perspective of the carrier. And, and the comment is about the net neutrality. I think that we need to, to explore uh, with more detail the, the net neutrality topic. I think it's not so simple. Our regulation obligations, and, and then we need to, to understand, finally, we have this, uh, I mean, if this is a problem or not. But even if it is not a problem, probably that could have implications in terms of scalability and so so at the end with net neutrality we need to to provide the the same behavior to whatever application so this could be a yeah a, a point that could imply maybe uh, scalability problems if we need to cover all kind of applications with the different details and so on and so forth so i need, i think that we need more more analysis on the net neutrality topic thank you <clears throat> so regarding the privacy question, um, I don't think we've thought much about the privacy model as it relates to a business running a network. Um, so that would be something to think about separately with it hasn't really, that hasn't come up exactly. Um, net neutrality, I agree it's a, a large topic. Um, it's one that it's not, we, we can talk about that as the part of the charter, but I, I think just historically with the ITF, like, um, but this isn't a regulatory or a policy body. Um, it does, and I, as far as I know, the ITF's not in the habit of making recommendations about policy. And so that's, it's a little bit tricky to put something like that in scope because it's not strictly protocol or internet engineering. Um, so it's, it's definitely something to think about because we're real people that, you know, run things on the internet. Um, but yeah, so it, whether or not that is explicitly part of like a working group item is, so yeah. I, I would say that this to understand the implications, I think is a matter of the working group. Thank okay. you. Right. Okay, I have to one side or other apparently. Um, so thanks, Matt. Uh, we're going to now take a look at the charter. Uh, so uh, as Martin's bringing this up, let me remind people, like, you know, clarifying questions are fine as we're going through this. Remember, we got 45 minutes after this to go discuss the charter and what we need to do to it or whatever. But if, if there's like words on it, it's like you don't understand them or something like this, like, you know, if we didn't define what ABR means or something, let's we talk about those questions as we go through the charter. Thanks. So this is rather long. Um, it starts out with a, with a wordy bit, providing some context. Um, this essentially, I'll, I'm not gonna read this out to everyone here, but I'm gonna give you a bit of time to, to process it. Uh, this establishes the, the context here. Video, there's a lot of it. This is the rate adaptation, it happens. I would like to point out in the, it happens today, I mean, um, whatever rate limit from a privacy point of view of protecting the network's information about what rate limits that is perhaps doing to a, a given flow or something, I mean, those are already revealed today by things like 
speed test for fast.com. And finally, this is, uh, this is the definition of ABR that I think um, we were talking about just now. Um, this is not exclusive to video traffic, but given that video traffic is vast proportion of the of the traffic out there, um, ABR is a, is a big part of that. Um, and this, is, this points out the, the problems in doing ABR under challenging network conditions, such as what uh, Marcus described with the token bucket filters and, and various other things. No questions on this? Does this seem fairly clear to people? The, this is the problem statement part, more or less. Ian. Ian Zweck, Google. Uh, the queue's locked. Um, oh, let's go. <clears throat> uh, I, particularly about this bit and about what Matt said, multiple times Matt said client side ABR. Um, yeah. Clearly, like in MOQ and other contexts, and like server side ABR is extraordinarily important, or at least potentially. Um, so for me, it kind of needs to be in scope. It doesn't seem like anything here says it's only client side ABR, um, but I wanted that to be clear. And the other thing is on the previous slide, um, it says you, we're constraining the maximum throughput for a client, but the mechanism we're developing is on a connection or a session. It's kind of pedantic, but I'm just like pointing out that like, I want to make sure- There may be a mismatch there, yes. I, I uh, wouldn't, the, yeah. This is, this is I, I believe, the goal of a lot of rate, edit, uh, rate limiting in networks is to, is to say that you, Ian, as, as a subscriber to the network, uh, receive this many bits. Uh, I think so. I'm not sure. Actually, I don't operate networks, so. I, I, yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, thoughts? So the, I think the problem is there is there's not even hand waving on um, what's the best that we can achieve without Scone Pro. Um, and uh, potentially other mechanisms that are less intrusive to the network, right? Um, so, so Thomas, I, yeah. I remind you that we're talking about clarification. Does this, are you getting to a point about, like, it sounds like you're trying to make it, a point it, about It may be more thing. fundamental, can, and that's fine, push it back. You, I'm, I'm can, just saying can that- Can you come back on yeah. the discussion when we, yeah. when we get yeah. to that? I'd like to get through all of the I mean, I think the general point, it's, it's very much hand-waving in, in, in the way how it is, tries to describe the problem, right? Of course. Uh, Glenn Dean, Comcast, NBC Universal. Uh, one comment, putting the explicit mention of ABR in the charter, I think won't age well. Uh, I think that it, it's sort of the, a networky type document talking about a specific mechanism that video transport today makes use of, but there may be other bandwidth impacting methodologies used by other transport video transport layer stuff. So my recommendation would be not specifically focus on ABR, maybe cited as an example, but not as the explicit thing that you're limiting yourself to focusing on. I'm if sure that the, makes sense. The proponents would be willing to take a full request, but I remind you that charters are temporary. Uh, it may be better feedback for an RSC. Uh, Char charters are temporary, but they're also sometimes used by people going, wait a minute, that's not in the charter, you can't talk about that topic. So sure. make it a little vaguer, and reference the ABR as an example, but not the explicit thing that you're limiting yourself to might make it a better, longer lasting charter. Yeah, that would be reasonable feedback for the discussion session. Uh, thanks, uh, Dick Edgy. Uh, Daniel Khan Gilmore, ACLU. Um, <clears throat> so I noted that earlier part of the charter mentioned something about the client, which is unclear what the specific client was. And then I just wanted to point out that um, Martin, as you said, the current schemes are about typically about identifying the particular user and saying you, user X, have a certain amount of uh, throughput to use. Mechanisms that are designed specifically to identify particular people on the network are problematic. And I hope this will not run in that direction. All right, that's a good comment. Uh, someone make sure that we capture that one. So I don't think that's what, where things are going. So. So Has uh, so from Cisco, I think the charter looks fine, but on the first uh, slide, I saw that this is very specific to the mobile network. Um, I just want to see uh, this applies not just for the mobile network. 
we need to clarify this or not, not sure, but just want to bring that thing. That, that comment came up and I think Matt addressed that. It is later in the chart. We'll, we'll, we'll deal with that. Yeah. It, later in the charter, we'll get back to it, thanks. So this is, I think, the key in the charter. We have one paragraph, it's very short. I'll read it. Um, the insert name here, working group's primary objective is to specify a maximum achievable throughput property for quick based streaming video and an on path protocol for securely communicating this property from a network device to, an, to a client endpoint. Now, I've heard suggestions that client and whatever else may not be appropriate. Hold those for the discussion, um, but just keep that in mind. All good? And allows us a clarifying question. Lars Egger, Mozilla, I'm and the, the on site tool is slow. Um, why only quick based? Ah, quick for now okay. is, the, uh, is the basic premise of this. We'll get to that. Uh, so solution characteristics, there's a lot of these. Um, and um, I'll go through them relatively quickly. Um, so the first property is, I think, in response to, to questions that we've had about, is this about clients? Is this, this about devices? Is this about anything particular? Uh, what was identified during the discussion was that having a, a flow associativity is, is what we're looking for, a particular flow of, in this case, quick based packets would be subject to the rate limit and not the connection, not the client, not the person, none of those sorts of things. The network can really only see flows and, and that's, the, that's an important uh, thing to understand. Um, single communication channel uh, for both the interactions here and uh, network properties and the network sends those network properties. Uh, Stephen. Uh, it says the same communication channel. Same as what? Uh, the, exactly. Uh, that needs to be worked out. <laughs> okay, so we, we don't know? I think, this is, I think this is a, Matt has a solution that uh, he's put up. It's a straw man, essentially. Uh, that says um, the same UDP flow, uh, which would be same destination, uh, same source and destination IP address and ports, and um, same address family, uh, probably in V6, the same flow markings and various other things like that. I, 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 the answer's not clear to me still, but maybe it's just me. So let me try and clarify the answer. The charter doesn't specify. It leaves it open to the working group to figure out the answer to that question. But it seems that we have example proposal, straw man proposals that indicate both types of solutions would certainly be viable to build. Does that, does that answer the question? So does that mean that this sentence could be deleted with? <laughs> no. Oh, okay. Well, then I'm, I, maybe it's just me. I just, I'm not following what same, what's the same as what. Marcus. So maybe that wasn't super clear, but when we say the same, we mean that the same, uh, so the client in the, um, identifies itself using some yeah. communication That's channel and the properties go back on that same communication channel. It doesn't have to be the same communication channel as the end-to-end -end traffic. It's just that the client uses some way of identifying itself to the network and the network responds on that same channel. Does it make it more clear? Okay. <laughs> okay, Martin. I think Tarvis is next. Let, let, let's avoid okay. jumping into the uh, discussions if we can at all, please. Tarvis. I'm trying to formulate this as understanding. So the, you folks are assuming for the charter that the place where, you know, this magic needs to happen, the network does allow scaling wise for per flow operations, both in terms of providing the bandwidth as well as uh, doing the signaling. Is, is that what I interpret That's essentially from that? what these three things say. Yeah. Yes. Which, which, which I think is fine as, as an assumption, I think whether or not the solution then actually does need to use that is I think a charter bashing discussion later on. Yeah. 
Right. Uh, Martin Duke, connection ID enthusiast. I, I'm sorry, I, I don't think the slide matches the words I think you used, Martin. Um, are we talking about quick connections that, or, or like UDP four tuples slash five tuples? Because obviously these are not the same thing. Right. And uh, and that is something we'll, the working group will have to work out. Yes. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I think I okay. Fair enough. That's my clarifying question. This is Daniel Kahn Gilmore. I was going to ask the same question as Martin Duke. Quick connection means something. It does not mean a flow in the sense of a stream. And it does not mean a flow in the sense of a four-tuple. So if we put in the charter that this is related to specific quick connections, and we decide that we are going to actually map it to something else, that seems a bit weird. There are multiple streams, which you could read as flows, per quick connection. And the quick connection itself can hop across four tuples. I think we're spending too much time on this. Um, th this uh, wording changed relatively recently. It used to say flow, and we decided that flow was too vague. But it seems like now we've decided that quick connection is now like either too specific or too vague, or depending on who you ask. So I just think we could probably move on from this. The the intention here is that you know it's <clears throat> related to it's related to an existing. Thing that was in the network, which is in practice a quick connection. Um, so, but we're kind of we, getting we, into we, semantics we here. here. Just, just to, we're way behind time. So, if I, we I, remove I, flow association as a as an added to this charter right now, and may, this sentence will be 100% clear that it relates to a specific quick connection, which is pretty well defined. Would that would that resolve this issue? Well, it will work? remove the ability to mark it against the four tuple. And I just want to okay, remind okay, folks. Okay, we'll move that. To, yeah. Can I remind folks that one of the goals of quick was to make it so that the network could not distinguish between multiple flows in the same connection. Yeah. So it is surprising yeah. if we are now chartering a thing that no, is You're 100% planning... right. We just used the word flow here wrong. You're, you're, you're Did right. Did you use flow you, wrong you, or connection wrong? I can't tell. Yeah. We used flow wrong <laughs> and probably connection wrong too. But <laughs> <laughs> so um, what I suggest we do right now is, is shelve this particular one. This is a topic we've come back to during the discussion session. And if anyone has any comments on this one, I request that you drop from the line and come back again when we talk through the discussion session. And we'll get through the rest of the charter um, and, and try to get a better understanding of that. This is obviously something we need to clarify. And, and we'll, we'll come back to that. OK? Uh, thank you for those who have dropped out. Appreciate it. Uh, John. Hey, hi, this is John Varsanek, YouTube. Uh, I had a question uh, on the previous slide about maximum achievable throughput, and if the, there's a stance on uh, sort of building more information about what that means. Is it like expected to be a hard limit or over some sort of uh, bandwidth connection as, as we use it in terms of de defining quick? Uh, I, I believe that that, again, would be something that the working group would, uh, would be discussing. What I've heard here is that maximum achievable throughput is uh, typically somewhat messy um, and flexible in some in some cases in some cases it's absolutely very very hard in other cases there's um, there's some sort of squish involved um, particularly in in certain network environments where the network might find it advantageous to let someone temporarily exceed that limit for some amount of time uh, and that sort of thing so um, I think that's in scope for discussion thanks okay thank you Christian Wittemar, uh, your definition of a quick connection is, appears cool, but what uh, does it include the use of the quick multipass extensions? May I request that you bring that back <laughs> to the discussion as I previously requested that we do uh, okay. later. I, I understand this, this, is a, this is a challenging and complicated topic but we're shelving it for now, okay? I was on the previous slide because you showed it again and I I didn't remember to ask a question before, Gory Fairhurst. Um, if we have a connection and we do this and we determine the throughput and then we make another connection on the same characteristics, do we get the same number a second time? Is it the maximum for the path or is it the maximum to that flow, which is obviously different that is that is a very good question and one that we can come back to yes i find come back to yeah tell us yeah i think a different variation of the question is there any particular time over which that guarantee is given or is that zero 
uh, once again. <laughs> the, the, the charter doesn't specify this, the working group would. Well, but I mean, it's for me, it's so. It's, um, yeah. To be clear, to be clear um, as Matt described, this is not congestion control. It's not on the time scale of a round trip time or, or something along those lines. This would be on a, on a longer time frame, and no one has specified that yet. Um, and the working group should be able to um, make the decisions about that. Please, please put that in the put charter. That, put that in the charter. Can yeah. someone take a note of that? That's a reasonable, reasonable request. If we get through the charter, maybe we can do that. Yeah, Miria. Uh, at this point, I'm going to start to cut. I just quickly wanted to add a point that this quick uh, connection thing is not, we don't need something to identify which packets belong to a certain connection because that's what people are worried about because the client will request this information. The reason why we have it in the charter is because we want to have a solution that works for quick traffic. That's the most important point I think we need to clarify. Okay. Moving on. So, um, we have on path to the earlier discussion. Please don't come back to that just yet. Uh, optionality. Uh, so the, the use of the protocol would essentially be uh, strictly optional for the functioning of the flow. Um, everything must work with whether this is on or off. Uh, and the properties are not directives. They would be advisory only. There would be no expectation that, that uh, an endpoint would treat these as strict rules that it, it was forced to abide by. Uh, seven, NAT rebinding resilience. Um, and here we talk a little bit about connection migration and multipath operation. And Lars is going to tell me this is wrong. No, I actually had a comment on the previous slide. Sorry, I was late. Can you flip back one? Uh, the first bullet is on path establishment. Do I read this correctly that basically there's no access control function that the client needs to engage with prior to doing any of this? Because it, it does, does it really matter that it's on path or off path? I mean, I don't quite understand what that's trying to say. Yeah, so um, let's put a pin in that one and we'll come back to that. That's a, that's a good, good comment. Um, getting back to it, NAT, NAT rebinding. It, it, this sort of stuff should work when NATs rebind and various other things. Um, it should be scalable. Um, we have a struck section here, the, the text that went to the mailing list and is on, in the um, thing uh, to Suas's point earlier, uh, this doesn't necessarily need to be limited to a particular type of access technology. So the suggestion would be to strike that. And finally, um, security, uh, you can read it. It's all the things that security does. Um, I don't know specifically what this is saying, so I'm going to put that in the, uh, <laughs> to the discuss section as well. If that's what you're up for, Stephen, noted, and we can move on. Uh, sort of. I mean, I, I, my reading of nine says we might or might not do some security stuff. Yeah, that's what I would. Oh, that's not good. Um, we'll have the ability to invoke does not do mean some security stuff. Because it's in the name of the group, crying out loud. Yeah. Well, no, no. So, I'm, so I'm, I'm reading it as saying that the, the the working group will think about security stuff, but the, the mechanism might or might not do any security stuff. Is that what's just intended? It says we'll have the ability to invoke, which doesn't mean must use. Oh, right. Yeah. I think that's that's, that's a mistake. Yeah. Good call. Huh? Okay. I think. Uh, Benjamin. Ben Schwartz, I, I want to say the opposite. Uh, I think if this has been scoped down to the point that we're not moving sensitive information, then we shouldn't define a bunch of unnecessary security things. And that's, I think, generally preferable. So uh, I would prefer that this instead say the working group sh like, will think carefully about security. And that's all we need to say. There's, there's, there's an argument to be had here that um, it would not be good if random off-path elements be able to send these signals. Uh, so there is a security component here potentially. Okay, I, I agree. TCP style security is, is potentially important here, but confidentiality, integrity, and authenticity doesn't really cover it. Okay. Christian. 
I think it is. Christian Uitemann, you told me to come back, so I'm coming back. I think you should track number seven. And the reason I say that is Quick is specifically designed so that paths, uh, that different use of different paths cannot be correlated. So by definition, your specification of number seven requires that you break that property. And I don't think we should have that in the charter. So uh, I, I think this comes back to the question about flows, connections, and, and what, whatever else. We need to resolve that. Um, but we shall resolve that specifically but, without trying to break the privacy properties of Quick. Sure, definitely. So, and that means that you cannot do that. Or you, you we're can, you we're hearing you, but we're, we're also requesting that you leave that for the discussion session. Is that okay? No, that's, it's not okay to have that in the proposed charter. Okay, but no, noted. Okay. Uh, I think it's a little bit a problem with, with the wording here, just a quick clarification. When we say resilient and network binding, quick connection migration and so on, it's that the client might migrate to different paths and might receive different signals from different paths and the client should be able to handle that. It's not that the network should be uh, potentially aware that this is a client that comes from one path to another. So I think it's a it's slightly different. It's not. Well, okay. I was told that we should have that conversation later. Yes. But <laughs> yes. We're, we're later is like 15 minutes from now. Not long. Okay. Not much later. <laughs> All right. So this is relatively new since uh, last time we met. Out of scope. So um, streaming video flows in transports other than quick um, out of scope for now. You can always recharge it. Uh, support for other types of media that re require extra properties rather than simply the maximum achievable throughput. Um, things like jitter and delay and all this sorts of other wonderful things that a network might be able to tell. Um, no. um, support, support for other attributes that the network might want to say, and um, anything related to congestion control. This is intended to operate on, on a different time scale. Questions? So Alex, you were in the queue here. Are you going to get up and say something? Hi, Alex Schnahovsky, uh, Meta. Sorry, I didn't realize that you had finished speaking already. Um, I wanted to quickly comment about the being limited to quick fit. Even though I am a quick enthusiast and I understand the desire to do quick first, I am a little bit uncomfortable because we have a lot of questions about what happens with this information. Should you apply to TCP flows, et cetera, et cetera. That Is I, this a question for clarification? Well, it's a question that I think that maybe we should change the charter to be more careful about can why I, we're doing quick first. Can I request that you come back during the next session? There'll be time for these questions, for these comments. Thank you. Yaroslav. Uh, Yaroslav, and that's Kaylor. Um, is bi-directional video out of scope or in scope? Is that something that we could clarify? My read of this is bi-directional is in scope. Um, if one of the proponents of this, if I got this wrong, somebody throw something at me. Okay, yeah, I'm seeing sort of nodding. Okay, then it would be great to clarify it in text. Thank you. Okay, so let's note that for the minutes. Hi, Glendine, two questions. Uh, is a, a playback scenario where the client manifest is making dis different quick connections to different content sources, but it's all part of the same player playback session in scope or out of scope. So for instance, a manifest that's got primary content, but is doing ad roll pulls from an ad server. Is that in scope or out of scope? My understanding is that's all in scope. Okay. I'm looking, yep, no, no, no one seems to be being, I got that wrong. So I think we're, I think we're in scope for all of that. I okay. mean, it has to be, this isn't useful if it isn't right. I mean, so. S second question is, is it explicitly out of scope to have extensible attributes that other people would want to add in in their implementations to communicate potentially other properties and other information? Yeah, I think that's, I think that's explicitly 
out of scope, the, the general purpose network attributes and um, additional network attributes. I mean, somewhat duplicative in the two and three, but I think that's- I, I read it that way, but I wanted to make sure that that's what exactly it meant. Okay, thank you. Corey yeah. Fairhurst, um, enthusiast for number four, but wonder what rate adaption is. We have rate adaptive transports and we're rate adaptive applications and just, what was the rate adaptive bit? Whatever you, whatever you like. Uh, you, uh, no, 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 because we're then. talking about rate adaptive applications, presumably, because that's why we're doing this. So it is in scope for rate adaptive applications, but probably not for transports. Think about it. Yeah, I, I, I think this is the intent of this was to, to carve out the congestion control aspects and, and that's just, just it. Uh, we may need to strike that last, that last clause. Uh, Tom. Hi there, uh, Tom Hell from BT. Um, on behalf of one of my colleagues, Chris Box, um, who'd left a comment on pull request 82, clarification here on what we mean by um, congestion signaling being out of scope. Um, if I may butcher his, uh, his response, his, his comments, but there's a bit of a difference here between um, how we deal with um, artificial limits that could be put in place to try and shape traffic or police traffic and signaling back the inherent variability of certain networks. So his point here was that, particularly in a mobile network where it is normal for the available capacity to fluctuate based on the number of UEs, the, the traffic you know that, that's currently being expected. Um, strictly reading that, I think it would say that we couldn't tell the client that the bandwidth is about to disappear. So the clarification was really on, can we dig down into what is appropriate in terms of signaling for rate adaption and what isn't? Wow, okay. But um, there's a much better write-up of it on, on the comments. From there, the is, there is a line here that's going to be a little bit difficult for a, a working group to, to work through. The idea of having a charter in this area is to, to establish a sort of guideline. And then obviously when it comes to rate adaptation and congestion control and the, 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 the continuum between them, there will necessarily be some, some amount of discussion within the working group about where the line is. And that's okay, that's healthy. Uh, the idea here is to is to explicitly carve out and say we're we're not we're not doing ECN, we're not doing OfferS, we're not doing any of those things, right. and we're only dealing with um, longer time scale rate adaptations. So those things are in scope for the charter, uh, in scope for a working group to discuss. We don't need to have very precise definitions of these things, otherwise we end up with long lines at the mics, just like we have right now. I just want to think, point out one two thing is too is we're not reporting the current bandwidth or the current congestion or any of those things. We're reporting a maximal ba upper bound on it, which is a little bit different than reporting the current. That's that's and I think that simplifies the problem somewhat. So keep that in mind when you're thinking about. It. Yeah, I I think the delineation comes into that the maximum upper bandwidth limit can change quite significantly, and and we Agreed. we have a we we have advanced knowledge of that should it be specifically out of scope that we couldn't communicate that? I don't know that we necessarily need to decide that in the charter, uh, mm. is, my, is my point here. Now, well, uh, Tom, yeah. I request that you, again, hold that for a little longer because that that sounds much more like discussion than, than us just reading through the charter. And we're way over time on this, on this, on this section. So if, just put a pin in that one and okay. hold it for a bit. Thank you. Louis. Hi, Luis from Telefonica. Uh, is regarding the uh, point three, these general purpose network attributes, and the only specific attribute mentioned in the charter is the, the, the maximum achievable throughput. So that would be the one in a scope right now. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Martin Duke, regarding item one, are we, again, are we envisioning a enforcement mechanism to make sure it is quick, or are we just not giving any guarantees to a client? To a client? Doing so, using some other protocol. Yeah, that, that would be that would be the intent. Of it. The latter. The latter. Excellent. Thank you. Christian Nuitema. I'm kind of sad 
that you decide to not say anything about ECN because you are proposing one mechanism to get we, feedback from the network. We, we, this is saying it, something about ECN. No. This is ECN's congestion signaling. Well, yes and no. It's exactly in the same field, in the same scope, that ECN is a signal from the network to the application about stuff. So you are going to have a conflict there and that conflict has to be explicitly addressed rather than pushed under the table. For example, suppose that I have received an allocation network telling me, hey, you could do two megabits. I do two megabit, I observe ECN bits being flopped on my traffic. What am I supposed to do? For respect the congestion controller, right? Well, but at least we have to say, we have to say that. Does it mean that basically the allocation is wrong? Does it mean that, et cetera? So we have to say that. We have to, we have to somehow. Right. So just, just a minute, let, let, me, let me try to. If I say the maximum is 10 terabytes per second on your 9600 baud modem, it, your congestion control still operate. This doesn't change anything that happens at the congestion control nor remove the need from it. It's a purely advisory limit of the upper bound. It just suggests you shouldn't go over a certain number at the application level. I think that's the only thing that's being proposed. No, 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 I'm, I'm not, from the shorter point of view, what I say is whatever the product is of this working group shall basically address that issue at least along the lines of what you're saying because it will be ambiguous otherwise. Please suggest text. Okay. Also, question. You mean shot of text? Yeah. Okay. ECN is about congestion signaling. It's got, it's called explicit congestion notification. So saying it's about an application thing is just wrong. This is, this is explicitly about an application signal. They are separate things that are composable together. That is the expectation. I, I understand that there are expectations. My only requirement is that those expectations shall be part of what we express in the product of that working group. That's what it says. It says it's not a replacement for congestion control, which is part of what ECN is. So it's not, it has to work Christian, with ECN Christian, because we need that's to part of the on. internet. We need to move on, please, Mo. Mozanati, um, the one network attribute that's in scope is the maximum achievable throughput. And since this was network to host signaling, I assumed, maybe I misinterpreted that as implying the maximum throughput from the network to the host. But then I was very confused to hear that this is also applicable for bidirectional, which implies the upstream limit also. Are there gonna be two separate bandwidths signaled? Um, and if there are, I think it should be clear in the charter which direction you're talking about and if there's a potential for both. So, so we have a note to, to clarify that in the charter already and, and that will be done, yes. Okay, moving on. Principles, uh, we have a set of established principles in 9419 and 9049. Uh, that have also included a bunch of lessons learned about what it is that we can and cannot do in terms of path signaling. Um, the working group will con consider those as input. The working group will also manage coordination with a great number of working groups and uh, groups uh, outside of this area even. And uh, there's a list of those here. I won't read them. And then finally, we have two deliverables. One would be uh, the mechanism, and the other one would be a study of the applicability of that mechanism. That, that, may, that may be a single document if it's possible, but the whole point of this is to say what we're gonna do. Does anyone have any questions about those? Really? Just again, not, not quite sure what is implied by protocol, right? So maybe something Mechanism, what's the difference between a protocol and mechanism? You know what a protocol is, Thomas, don't you? <laughs> I, I think the question is, what, what are the implications you're trying to, 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 to take from that? Uh, is ECN a protocol? Yes. Well, sort of, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
if you've got a proposed change, like think about it for a few minutes, come back a bit. So, sorry, so you're going to answer this question? I was going to going to try. Protocols have lots of mechanisms to do things. It, this may be just a mechanism, as it it works with the protocol. But like, we don't want to spend this discussion here. This this yeah. isn't changing. Charge. Okay, we'll take a note to to wordsmith this better. Um, okay, so. Uh, Martin, what do you think of starting with the flow topic? Okay, so on the, the things of like, you know, is this quick, non-quick? Is it a four tuple? Is it, you know, what is a flow? How does ATM work? All of those issues. Um, if you've got a question on those, if you want some comments on how we should improve this charter or what it needs to say to, to have that correct, jump on a mic line, you know, jump on the queue and let's have a mic line discussion on that. So I'm going to get those those slides up, and we can have those. This charter is too long. Right there, we are. This will this will be where we can focus that. I see DKG. Hi, uh, Daniel Khan Gilmore. So I think this is a fundamental problem with this proposal, which is that everybody here thinks that we know what we're talking about, and we're actually all talking about different things. And you know, we've seen this before. It happened. It's happened in the past. But I want to remind folks that part of the design of Quick was to obscure information about which flow is which from the network operator. And we are now trying to charter a group that has the explicit intention of signaling or relating which flow is which to the network operator specifically for Quick. And whatever de definition of flow we land and everyone on. Everyone that's a, a, a proponent of this is shaking their head. So I agree with we're, we're, we're meaning different things by this and we need to fix this, but I don't think that's a goal. I'm just telling you from watching at the front of the room. Great. Okay. So, I mean, yep. well, I'd love to hear an explanation where we're all on the same page about what we are identifying when the, and, and one that does not break one of the design goals of Quick. We're into the discussion stage, so this would be a good time. So, yeah. It, it, uh, <laughs> Spencer Dawkins. Um, so we, this started out being like per application information, and we're not entirely sure what that means after after talking about it. Um, we moved that to specific quick connections um, because we know what those are, and because those. Uh, Anybody, anybody who's terminating anything understands what a uh, five tuple is, basically. So um, we didn't. We need to make sure that uh, the word flow goes away completely. And I'm sorry. That I apologize that the charter still has the word flow in it. Uh, but uh, the the goal is not to make anything visible about anything inside quick connections. Oh, yeah. Uh, Jahid, uh, so uh, I, I really would like to understand what Dickie was saying. So just to just to follow my clarification. So you're saying like we design quick just to for that the network or anybody in the path doesn't really know what we're doing in the client, right? But now you're here, we're using some information in the quick saying like, I'm aware. That's what the problem is. So I have a quick, I've established a quick connection to you. Can we agree yeah. that that connection has a connection ID? Yes. I might change that connection ID yes. and it would still be the same quick connection, but the network wouldn't know, yes. right? Yes. Okay. So we already know that quick connections are not the same as application connections. Yep. Within a given quick connection, I can have multiple streams. Some of those streams might be ABR, and some of the streams might not be ABR. Yep. And the network provider cannot distinguish between those streams because they're all within the same quick connection. Yep. So, so the quick connection is neither one single stream nor multiple streams. Yep. Nor uh, a linkage between streams. It's yep. none of those things. Yep. And yet we are trying to associate semantics for one ABR flow against a thing that is not that, manifestly not that for anything that the network operator can currently distinguish. So either we're chasing something that doesn't exist or we're trying to break the, the properties of Quick and describe a different scenario to the network operator than Quick currently describes. Does that make sense? 
yeah, I mean, I understand what you're saying, but my understanding so far um, is like, okay, if you get something from the network on Iscon Pro, um, it actually, the application need to handle like how the network doesn't know which flow within a quick connection is AVR or not. That is still valid. It's like application information. So if that is not the case from the uh, uh, proponent point of view, I would like to have the discussion before we move on because this is very fundamentally imp important for this working. Right. So if we want to be, if we want to say there is a quick connection identified by a connection ID, and we want the network, we want the client to be able to signal some part of this connection may itself be ABR, and then the network operator to say, hey, just so you know, if you've got ABR stuff in here, here's some general guidance about what kind of limits there might be. Now we're talking something a little bit clearer. But the charter, as it currently stands, makes claims about uh, connection and changing, yeah. about multipath, about um, flows within a quick connection, and I, all of that seems okay. important. So I, I think so I think we just, understand. Just, just a second before, DKG, before you leave, just think about what would you. I don't think anybody wants to look in any of that information. Okay, that's not the intention. So what would be the right way to phrase this that made that clear? Exactly. What, what would be the, what would be, how, I agree with every, I hear what you're saying and I agree. So how do we rephrase this? They don't want to look at any of that information. So, I mean, I think we could say this quick connect, we could say that the signal that we're proposing here, mm -hmm. I'm not sure that I want this either, but we yeah, could sure. say Just how to, yeah, the clear. signal we are proposing is that a client that uses a quick connection may signal that the quick connection contains ABR, not is ABR because there are multiple streams, right? right? And then the network operator has the opportunity to uh, tell the client, hey, this quick connection that we are talking about um, has the following uh, limits, whatever those things are. That, I think, is a coherent frame, but it has nothing to do with flows in the sense that application layer thinks of flows. So what you just described is was the intention, which is to say that th this, this contains ABR video, because the, the, the idea here is that this is an alternative to what's currently being done, which is that that information is coming implicitly from, they see a quick flow, they extract the SNI, they say, oh, look, this matches an SNI that I have determined has ABR video. They could contain other stuff too, but they don't care, right? It says, the SNI says it's video, so I've decided it's video. Okay, so I, I had actually said ABR and didn't say video. I think it's deeply weird that we would not want to have adaptive bitrate for other things and that we would want to signal, hey, I'm watching a video stream. Why would we do that? Um, I, could, I, can, I can imagine a, a, a high bandwidth stream, say, of financial data, that there are certain things I'm most interested in, and latency matters for those things, and I want those things to show up, but I'm also happy to ingest the fire hose to the point that I have capacity for it. That's adaptive bitrate, and I don't want to signal that that's distinct from video. So the, the, the reason it's limited to video is, one, because these practices are currently only really applied to video, and two, because by limiting the scope to just that, it makes the problem clearer rather than, you know, there, these, these. Well, that's a nice theoretical example that, like a high bandwidth stream of financial data, that's not something that's currently done. So, like, we could have something that says it's more generic, but a more generic problem is harder to charter clear scope around. Whereas video is a, like a known thing that people kind of understand. Let's move forward in the line here. Thanks. So, Gary Fairhurst. Um, Enthusiasm for having more information to tell people what bit rate is the maximum, uh, but agree with what was just said, right? I mean, we're talking about a pipe here. It may contain one flow, it may contain many flows. It could be masked. It could just be a whole pile of other stuff that includes ABR traffic. And I really think we should be talking about ABR traffic. We're not tagging this as a video. We, we don't know what that pipe contains. I do have a little nit. Okay, uh, do you want to come back on that one? I, 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 look, I think I think it's obvious this thing he doesn't even have a mechanism to detect whether it's video or something else. So look, let's let's work on the assumption we'll update the charter to be ABR traffic is where this is relevant. And look, if your traffic's not ABR, you can find out still find out what the rate of ABR traffic might have been, right? So, so you know, I, I think that's the reality of where we are, right? Okay. Okay. And I think we should also just everybody in line proceed on. We will you know get this very clear. There is no intention to look inside of anything that would be normally be encrypted by a quick connection. This does not change quick in any way or that sort of deployment, right? I think that's that's also sort of everyone's on the same page there, though our words are not. <laughs> and I want to try the second one again. What happens when we have another connection via the same box and it also asks for this information? Does it just get the same number back? Or might it get a different number back because one's already gone through the box? It, we're talking about a maximum here. This doesn't frighten me, but I just want to know what happens. Yeah, sorry. I, 
I imagine that, that there is a, there's going to be a limit to what this technology can do in terms of being able to distinguish these things. If you have two things between the same two IP addresses, for instance, um, whether the network sends the same signaling for that flow or not um, will be up to the network. And uh, I think that's the best that we can probably achieve in this. In this Quite happy with that. Thank you. Uh, Martin Duke, so I, I would so I would associate myself with DKG's comments about quick connections and migration, et cetera. And what I would propose as a concrete thing is to eliminate the, the words quick connection and replace it with UDP4 tuple that carries quick. And if, if nobody's a problem with that, then I can stop talking. Anyone going to stand up and object to that? So I think that's what we mean. Okay, right, let's work with that going forward. Thank you. So before you go away. There are, there are um, additional things we might need to consider here. Um, so UDP4 tuple, great. Um, that explicitly rules out connection IDs as, a, as part of that. Is, that. is that okay with people? I'm seeing nodding heads, good. And it also disregards things like uh, flow labels and things like that at the IP layer. All good? All good? Well, that was easy. Um, please concentrate on that as the definition and try to poke holes in that. Yeah. Yeah, uh, so as Francisco, <clears throat> I, I think the definition of path is four tuple. If you want uh, to use something from the quick, we can just say a quick path, because if there's only one path, there's four tuple, is a default one. If there are multiple paths, and each will have it, its own four tuple. Um, having said that, given, given that this is an advisory role, that's what we're saying, it's not uh, an, an application which decides to mix uh, ABR or non-ABR, it's, it's, it's application decision. It might not get the behavior it wants, but an application which wants to do right will not mix uh, streams with ABR and non-ABR. I think we should uh, not go too deep into what will happen in the stream level, but keeping at the path of the four triple level should be good enough for this. Uh, QMISL MPI inf. Um, what, from what I've gathered here, we're agreeing that this is entirely advisory and that there will be additional mechanisms to enforce this separately, like congestion control, and there may still be an adaptive bitrate shaper, but this is an advisory role to get the client to play nicer with how the network wants its traffic. Why, in that case, do we need to make any connection to a UDP4 tuple or anything at all? if we can just make it so that the client can ask the network, hi, what bandwidth do you recommend I use to connect to Netflix? And then there is no need to, the enforcement mechanisms operate on the four tuple layer. The, this information that we're providing is advisory. The client can then be a, behave better from the perspective of the network. And there's no need to connect it to the connection itself because if the, the client can ignore this information anyway, so this isn't going to change anything about how the network treats the connection. You, all we really need to provide is a way for the client to ask some advisory information about a connection. And we can define additional metadata that goes in that request, like, oh, I'm making a connection to this IP address, or I'm making a connection to this service provider. Um, but it doesn't, I don't see a reason why it needs to be connected to a specific UDP four tuple or any other connection. So um, I think that this is a slightly different thing when it comes to the security property, and maybe we'll discuss a little bit more there. But one of the security properties is that the device that's providing this information can prove that it's in a place that could actually do this enforcement. It's just not a random message by some third party off, you know, UFO. Right, yeah. And we also have the issue of the sort of discoverability type things where we have, um, th there's not one network involved, there's many networks always, yes. and like which, which, which network and where do you flow through and, and that type of stuff. So I think that that was, I'm speaking for the proponents here slightly, but I, I think that that was sort of one of the underlying things to say, you know, we'll, we'll, it's it's an on path connection thing. This the thing that's sending you this information can effectively prove that it could be doing this rate shaping. That it's it could enforce this upper bound that it's claiming. Um, and, and you know, I, whether that's a great property or not property, I, I, I'm not arguing. I'm just saying I think that that was the logic behind this design versus 
uh, something completely I, different. I still think that proving that is possible to do without tying it to a specific connection. Well, we look forward to your draft describing that. Thank, um, you. <laughs> thank you for volunteering. Hello, uh, Watson from Akamai. Um, I think that a lot of people are discussing the kind of solution rather than sort of charter. I don't think the charter should be read so specifically as to say, oh, we have to do flows. We have to associate with the quick ID versus four tuple. I think those are things that we should ideally leave to the working group. I do want to push back on saying on the congestion control thing. I understand the intent. I agree with the intent. This is not another ECN. But we absolutely do want things like pacing to be aware of the bandwidth characteristics on longer time scales. I think there, you know, the stuff that Netf that was put forward in that Netflix paper has been linked in the chat relies on an interaction between the ABR and the congestion controller working together and saying this is the bandwidth we're going to go up to and here's how we do it. There isn't really a clean division between the ABR part and the congestion controller part in regulating that. I think we should include solutions that are unified, even if we're saying we're not doing the short-term congestion controlling. Okay, Philip. Hi, Philip Teasel, Splickness Individual. Um, I wanted to ask something very similar to what Q asked, uh, meaning that do we actually need the flow so, so, so associativity to solve the given problem. So if we go back and think what we really need to solve the given problem, I think it could be much more interesting to go back and really define the problem and not so much go into the so uh, solution space as the charter already goes. And uh, if we go there, what I don't see in the charter is the question whether it thinks about the whole path or just about the last portion of the path. And I think this is, I would just re like to remind there that we really should try to understand the problem we are solving, not so much go into the solution space. Okay, Pete. Uh, yeah, Pete Resnick. Um, and I think following up on Philip, number three there, the network does a lot of work. Um, I really would like the charter to be explicit and maybe it's perfectly fine for which networks we're talking about and is the client asking every network along the entire path to give multiple answers to the question or is that out of scope and we're only talking about the last hop, the last couple of hops and it's not the entire path. I think it should be clear in the charter what's going on here. Yeah. Thanks, Pete. I'd just like to remind people we're running short on time for this conversation, so please be brief. I want to let it run out, but be brief. Uh, last I got was along, along that's what Gory asked earlier. So, so um, the information that comes back from the network, is that tied to the particular, I guess, quick carrying for tuple is the lingo now, or is that a endpoint cap? Um, or or do, don't we know yet? If it is tied to the, to the for tuple, Right, it incentivizes opening multiple four tuples, which exposes additional information to an observer about what you're doing, because you can't hide your stuff in one quick connection anymore. Right? Sounds like a great conversation for a working group to have, yes. So I think we need to put this in the charter. I think we really need to know what, okay. what, what information is this carrying, because it yeah. really you know, depends on the mechanism we're going to build. Mike Bishop, Akamai. I think a lot of this comes down to mm -hmm. the fact that the parties in this protocol have different things that they can see, and we're used to having protocols be a little more equilateral, that the client knows where the connection is, the network path elements don't, only the other endpoint does. And same thing with ABR. The client knows that it's doing ABR, the network path elements maybe infer it, but they don't know. I feel like we really don't need to mention that in how the protocol works or even in the charter other than as, uh, as motivation. But I, I think what we're really asking for is a way for the client to send something down a network path 
that says, if you are imposing characteristics on this path, please tell me. And all of the, these other pieces, it's motivation, it's how we think it can be used, but I'm not sure that belongs in the charter. Thomas. So I think we really need a much, much stronger, if at existing at all, um, problem statement in the charter and one that really explains why this is necessary as opposed to kind of the best combination that we have from existing technologies, including ECN, including L4S, including something like um, uh, pre-congestion notification, all those things that we can move, right? I think I understand the answers. I've, I've been wanting something like this for 20 years, but I mean, the, the operators would have to pay new money for, you know, better router features to do this. And so I think they're rightfully asking why the heck is all the stuff that, you know, was done so far, not good enough out of which much is not deployed, but could simply be configured without new software on the routers. This is new software on the routers. So please have that problem statement. I mean, I, most people don't even understand why ABR works like ABR does, right? So in terms of the burstiness that it needs for measurement and so on, right? So the, I was looking at, at, at the drafts that are out there. And I, I don't think it's a good problem statement that, that really gets to the point we must have something like this. And um, I'll, I'll keep the other, um, you know, charger things uh, for the list. Mark? Mozanati, um, a meta point on the presentation. Uh, I think it was mentioned that the, maybe able to remove uh, policers if you signal this. I, I don't. I don't believe that's a realistic uh, possibility. Um, so I, I'm glad it didn't show up in the in the charter. Um, but I just, you know, like to make sure that everyone's aware that this is unlikely to change anything operators actually do. Uh, so does this work useful even if operators don't change anything they do? Um, keep that in mind. Uh, on the charter itself, the, the three points. Um, I'm very glad that Pete went first because that was my main thing. Which networks, how many networks, what rates, how many rates. Uh, that was a, a very important thing I was missing. The, the second point, um, the single communication channel, I didn't read that as the on path for the actual application flow. So I think you just want to say single communication channel for both client initiation of application flows and network priorities. I thought this would allow the use case of I, sig I signal directly to this server um, using what I would normally use and get something back. So single communication channel didn't apply to me, the application flows also. Maybe useful to clarify that in, in, in the charter. Thanks, Mark. Dennis? Uh, Dennis Jackson, Mozilla. I think like I echo a lot of DKG's concerns and seeing something stronger in the charter around privacy would seem to be valuable. Like the stuff that's there for security is, is nice, but why can we not strive for something better that makes it, that doesn't involve the client revealing anything about the network traffic type? Like if networks just wanna shove data down to clients, that's fine, but networks don't need to know anything about whether clients are consuming that data or what they're doing with it. Two cents. Cool, thanks, Dan. Uh, there's been some, there's been some chat, uh, some text in the chat. Uh, Dennis was suggesting a kind of a one-shot thing and somebody says we have a draft like that. If it's, if there's a possible solution where the network just sends information to the client without the client exposing, identifying information of any kind, then I think chartering to only aim for that solution would be the right thing. If that solution is impossible, then I don't know what to do. Uh, so I'm, I'm not suggesting specific charter text, but rather that if a single shot, as it was mentioned in the, in the chat, if, if that kind of thing is possible, I think chartering for that and only that would be a good outcome. So I, I got a question, I, can't, I, I've, I was lost track of the chat, so I haven't followed this. Can somebody summarize, is, is the proposal that the client would receive unsolicited traffic with this number or two numbers in it, that it, it just somehow arrived that it never asked for, which it normally wouldn't expect? Is that the proposal mm -hmm. Is that or not? I think so, yes. Yeah, okay, okay, great, thanks. So kind of a DHCP ambient network property sort of thing? So uh, just, just, just yep. uh, from a chair perspective, I'm gonna reopen the queue. I think we've moved on from the flow question. Oh, uh, no, we haven't. Have we? we have not? 
Sorry, we are moving on from the flow question. After I don't M9. think you can do that. <laughs> um, to more general topics. It's in scope still, of course. So, I don't think the flow association requirement is well motivated. Um, it allows uh, a network, if, if this thing takes off and gets implementation, it allows a network to discriminate between flows. That has obvious implications for network neutrality. Um, and so I would expect to see the balancing done there of, of what justifies this level of access. So just a second, I want to ask, I want, I want to poke on this a little bit deeper today. So without this mechanism, clearly on almost every major commercial network, the limit is different depending, depending on, on where you live. Depending on which plan you're on, right? Depending where, on where you live, yes. It's, Name it's a country where it is, where all subscriber plans have the same bandwidth. Name one. Okay, I'll give you that right. there may be one. But I, okay, but, we but can they're carry not on. They're but. not discriminating on a per flow basis. Ah, that's what you're trying to get is the per yes. flow basis? per flow basis, yes. Okay, but yeah. I see. They're I see doing it on a per endpoint basis, client okay. endpoint. Right. Yeah. So I, what I was going to go with this is I don't think that this changes. Whatever, all they're doing is reporting all they're going to do today. This doesn't change what they're doing today. That's that's the clarification but, but that I want to But by allowing them to do it on a per flow basis, they can report different things to different flows. And today they can rate limit different flows to different things if they're in a jurisdiction where they do that. Right. So the next part of my comment was uh, we but, are seeing... But do you want us to do something in the charter about that issue, though, is the question that I'm trying to get to on that. Like, what should we do? I said it. I, I didn't think it was well motivated. So I, I just okay. I want to see the math. Okay. You know, yeah. Uh, deployment of privacy proxies is becoming more prevalent, and I don't see any work done, in, and again, maybe I just haven't looked in the right place, about how this interacts with those. And if it disadvantages them versus not using a privacy proxy, I think that's probably not a great place to go. Finally, um, my understanding, and again, apologies if I'm wrong, the proponents have a, 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 a kind of a, a sketch of how they want to do this. And that involves diverting the flows into a proxy. Uh, the last I saw. Not anymore? No? Okay. I'll back away from that one then. All right. I, just, I was reminded of IMAP and how we're still using that. I just want to jump in quickly to say that, um, Mark, we, when you're talking about flows, again, we, we just had this whole conversation about what flow means. So to answer specifically, you're saying they're not discriminating on a per flow basis. If you define a flow to be a UDP4 tuple through the network, they're absolutely, it's very common practice to discriminate on a per flow basis in that regard. And that is a common practice today. Um, and this does not change any of that. It just changes the, to be a communication mechanism rather than applying adaptations at the network layer to those quote unquote flows, which is to say a UDP four tuple through the network. And following on that, I make a suggestion that we stop using the word flow with no adjectives because it's confusing the hell out of people who are trying to catch up. My apologies for that. that we, no, I, good I mean, suggestion. We, we right. all did. That's what the charter said. I'm just saying we've learned something. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to add something to what Mark just said. Like we, we are deploying, we're seeing more and more mask deployment. And it is um, conceivable that all the traffic that's coming out of my phone is going through a single, what looks to the network as a single flow, because it's all going um, to the same um, iCloud private relay um, um, hop. So if all my traffic has the same four tuple, it looks like quick, um, but has, um, flows from different apps that are doing things on my phone at the same time, then it seems like like binding this to the flow is just not the right abstraction. So is what we are really talking about here a limit that the network imposes on a subscriber and all flows that are associated with that subscriber? And we are just... Um, mentioning the flow here because that's that's the easy thing to think about because we are transport people. Ted. Ted, you're up. 
uh, Chad Hardy, not a transport people. Uh, and, uh, I, I think that uh, item one would be better phrased as the network communicates applicable properties of the path as it relates to a specific user. This ensures that the user's applications can apply actions to that path to use it effectively. And I believe that that's because what we're trying to replace here is an on-path device that shapes the traffic on the path. And we're saying, for this path, I am notifying you of the existence of the shaper so that you can behave in a way that knows that this limit is in place so you don't constantly bump up against it to find it. So I believe that we really don't want flow associativity. We want a statement from the network about a characteristic of the path. And I've had many conversations with the, the, the folks involved in this. And yeah, we could do it with Alto. And yeah, we could do it with an on-path signal. Yeah, we could do it with something else. We can work that out in a working group. But I have to be very, very clear that I think what we're talking about here is a path signal about a characteristic of the path that applies to a specific user of that path. And I think if that's what's in the charter, we'll have the problem statement we need to look at the different options correctly. Thank you. So I have someone up, up and. Uh, Yaroslav Zetskaler, uh, three suggestions to uh, maybe tighten up some text in Charter. Um, I would suggest to change wording client to endpoint. I think signaling to servers could be as valuable as signaling to clients, especially if bidirectional video is in the Charter. Also, if only one party of communication supports Cone Pro, um, they could benefit from uh, having that signal. Um, second suggestion is to, instead of network operator, just talk about network. Uh, some things in the path, not necessarily network operators, but can produce meaningful, important signal. For example, 4G modem or enterprise router that might advise to consume less bandwidth during business hours for uh, video streaming or what have you. Um, and finally, I'm not entirely sure if it falls into Charter, but it feels to me that Scone Pro could produce very valuable signal for a quick multi-path uh, selection. Uh, so not just to adjust video bitrate, but also in case of multi-path to maybe suggest certain different paths to be used for uh, video stream if multiple is available. Thank you. Martin, uh, Martin Duke, uh, two points and a question. Um, uh, regarding like four tuples, uh, I don't really know what these filters are doing. If they're doing it based on IP address pair or even just client IP address, like I think that's fine. That doesn't that doesn't affect them. that that isn't that compromise the the security and privacy properties of Quick. So I would be fine with the framework allowing a a, a the network to express. I'm you know I'm, I'm assigning this to you as an endpoint uh, for all flow, for all connections, etc. Um, second item on mask, I think, you know, there's a basic problem with this token bucket, bucket filtering when everybody's aggregated in a single four tuple or what have you. And that's maybe a little bigger problem than, than scone pro. And I think if you're a client behind a mask proxy, you probably shouldn't use scone pro, or at least not take it as gospel for the number of bits you get, because you're obviously sharing it with other clients. And then my question was, um, there was no mention of uh, a discovery mechanism in here. Is that in scope or not in scope, or is it just kind of fall out of the likely design that you would discover it? I think the intent was to uh, make that part of the protocol, uh, whether it's needed or not. I think there's there's some lack of clarity on that point in <clears> terms of the technical details that the working group would do. Okay, so it might be good to have something in the chart that just says like, there shall be a way for you to figure out that there an in-band way for you to figure out that that scone pro is there in the network to be utilized thanks okay. well. mozanati um i don't think the charter should talk about the flow associativity or the endpoint or the user subscriber or where the limit applies i think the fundamental thing here is 
there is a network entity that wants to signal this maximum throughput. And I think along with that signal should be what that's relevant to. Because I think different operators may have different limits. Some may be subscriber-based, some may be per UDP flow-based. So I think the proper solution is not to burn into the charter what the granularity is, but to say that it must be signaled along with the flow maximum rate, what that applies to. Does that apply to your physical device ID? Does it apply to your IP tuple? Does it apply to your UDP tuple? Does it apply to your uh, some other application level token? I think that should be the right granularity in the charter to allow solutions to match what the operator's granularities really are. And they may be different. Ben. Ben Schwartz, Meta. Uh, I'm not, a, I have no personal involvement in this work. Uh, so just as an observer, I, th I think that uh, video is extra special in a way that maybe we haven't totally grappled with here because the video systems will naturally use all available bandwidth on the link for the entire duration of, of the usage time, if allowed. Essentially, the bit rate can just go to infinity. Um, this is very different from a file transfer or any of the sort of classic things that TCP congestion control was designed for. So uh, because of that, we need to think about the way it, it uses data in the network very differently. <clears throat> And, and that's why I think it does make sense that this charter talks about video directly. Uh, it's also why we can't just speak in very general terms about conveying interesting information about things that are happening on the network. Because the point is that there are policies that are being implemented in some ways on the network that are specific to video. Because for things like a file transfer, they don't make sense. They, the operator wants you to download your file as fast as possible and get it over with if the bandwidth is, is available right now. But with video, giving you more bandwidth just uses more bytes in total, so uh, so that it doesn't it doesn't pay off in the same way. The one thing that I am confused about still from the charter is really uh, point three that the the information it's supposedly only flowing from the network to the client, but I hear hints in this charter that there's also some sort of indication from the client to the network or from maybe from the server that this flow is going to attempt to comply with that limit and therefore that the network might, if it has sufficient faith in that signal, uh, adjust its limiting behaviors. Uh, from the charter, I can't tell if that's in scope or not and that radically changes the solution space and the policy implications and everything. So I'd, I'd like that to be very clear. Okay, David. Thanks, yeah, I was in queue and I got up and then Meet Echo dropped me from the queue, sorry about that. So David Skenazi, uh, privacy proxy enthusiast, building a massive fleet of these things. Uh, so I wanted to address some points in this space. So first, while I agree that what we build here can be used for many things, let's say a banking data, data bitrate algorithm, the, the reason we have such a focus on video is that that's the problem we're facing today. Uh, the reason that a bunch of network operators have deployed rate limiting traffic shapers is that video was so much, uh, such a high percentage of their traffic. So that's why people are coming to the table because they have a real problem that needs solving. <clears throat> I don't, I'm not saying that the solution that gets built here has to be, you know, if it's not video, it must not work. But I think putting in the scope of the charter, it must be designed for video, it makes a lot of sense. That's the problem we're solving. If someone uses other creative fuses for it later, that's fine, that's great. Um, and then second, in terms of the uh, collective face plant we did on flows earlier, um, <clears throat> similarly, the, the problem we have and what we're trying to fix is that, let's say you have a user but a user from the network's perspective is this vague concept. It could be an entire household behind a NAT. It could be my phone with my, a bunch of you know, tabs open on this browser or my phone with a laptop behind it like on a hotspot. So there's gonna be much, multiple applications going on for what the network considers a user. And one of them could be a video flow that we need to do something with because right now if they don't tra traffic shape it, the network melts, and there are going to be other things like, let's say, someone like 
browsing regular browsing the web, which is something that is much burstier, ends up being lower bandwidth at the end of the day, but that's something that you really don't want to traffic shape because that's going to really harm your user's experience. So my understanding for why there's flow here, which I think it should be, is that the notion of the shaper today only applies to some of these, and this solution should maintain that property. I think we probably want to drop the notion of like quick connections in there because the privacy implications that were discussed are true. We don't like we want to be able to migrate in a way that the network doesn't know. And I think some of the proposed solutions don't break that at all. So I think the focus here is on the charter text. And I think we can get something that solves the problem that the proponents want without harming the privacy properties that a lot of us care about. Uh, so all this to say, I'm really supportive of this work. I think it's important we should do. And I think what we need is to massage this charter for it to work. All right. So I've had a lot of discussion here about a number of things, and it's pretty clear to us now that the charter in its current form will not be approved by this room or any any group of people in the ITF. I think I think that's that's relatively clear. Uh, it seems to me like there's some there's still some questions we want to ask uh, about the the general topic, but I think this, this is going to be about this, um, this very difficult question of scope and applicability that we need to resolve. And that's not going to happen here today. But there's been a number of conversations that, that we'll need to continue on, on, on that one. Um, what questions do we want to ask? Is that, so, I mean, I, I, so, sorry, just need, need to lose my care. Um, I'm, I'm not, I, I'd like to sort of, you know, confirm consensus and we'll figure out how to phrase the question correctly here in a second. I'm not trying to phrase it right now, but it, it does seem that we're fairly comfortable with moving this to be very clear that this is about a, you know, UDP five tuple or a power tuple, however we phrase it, that that's, that's the, the network information of what we're connecting to here. That's what's visible by the network that's this and, you know, make it clear that there's, there's no intention in any way to be looking inside of the things that, that Quick is protecting for it, with its security guarantees, right? So I, I like sort of some of that. It also seems, so that's, that's sort of one question I'd like to go on. Um, people are like, no, 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 I couldn't live with that. Um, in fact, I'm not even sure we need a question. Is there anyone in the room that would, would really strongly object us to moving the charter to be that, to be very worded very clearly that way? Okay, I'm not seeing one leap up. Now, the next set of information that seemed interesting that came up here a bit was a bunch about um, the, the, does the client even need to reveal to the network it's interested in this type of information, okay? Or does the network just always provide, if the network's the type of network that provides this information to some of its five tuples, it provides it to some, you know, all of its five tuples, like that would be fine, right? Um, so, uh, I, you know, I, I think that that does have the thing that existing clients today that don't support this mechanism are suddenly going to start receiving some packets they don't understand, right? That's the trade-off there. So does anybody want to, so are people okay with us just moving the charter to be like, you're going to get the information unsolicited, unsolicited about this rate limit for networks that decide to support it? Is that a, anyone object strongly to that, us moving the charter that direction? and eliminating this one direct, the upstream sort of signal? Go for it, Mary. Oh, sorry, we're, we're, we're doing too many things at once as chairs here. Um, but, but go to the mic anyway, and we'll, we'll form a queue as you. Yeah, I think that decision should, should be left to the working group. I don't want to rule it out, but I don't want to put it in a charter. Fair, okay. I saw some other thumbs up to that. Okay. This is Spencer Dawkins. I just wanted to follow up uh, after Miria's uh, thing. So we were thinking that this information would be coming to the client through a quick connection. So if a client has not opened a quick connection to find this information out, we would not be, it would not be receiving it, would it? You're deep into the solution space. Yeah, no, the no, I, I, I am sure yeah, we can introduce. I, I was just yeah. saying, the, the, just the architecture, like how do you how do you send something on on a surprise quick connection? Um, ICMP <laughs> manages to do it all the time. Um, okay. <laughs> Can I provide some reasoning? Because uh, Stephen, you said if there is a working solution for that, and I think we don't know that yet. So 
you know, we cannot put it in a charter because we are not there. I, I, I agree with what you said, um, but for me that implies we shouldn't charter anything if there's no solution that has the right properties. I think we've got, there's going to be a clear range of opinions here. I don't even need to take a poll. I can like look at people's like expressions on their faces and see that there's a range on that one. Okay, um, next on the queue was Mo. Can we bounce to it? Mo Zanetti, so just to clarify Colin's point about unsolicited, I don't think it necessarily has to be unsolicited in the sense of you didn't send a single packet, that the client didn't send a single packet. I think it could be generalized so that on any outbound connection that a client makes with some optional indicator in that outbound connection, that I'm willing to accept Scone Pro data, that any network entity can come back and signal on that connection that, that, that this is the limit. So I, I don't think that's not unsolicited. That's not a, a, an unaware client receiving it. It's a Scone aware client receiving a generalized signal coming back on every connection it makes. I think that would remove most of the privacy concerns and it would remove most of the concerns about limiting this just to ABR video. Uh, QMISL, MPI Inf. I can think of several ways that this could work. Um, the client, and I guess there's also a question about when is this information signaled? Is this information signaled before um, when a client connects to a network at some intermediate time, when it's starting a connection, during the connection? Um, does the client have to explicitly ask for one piece of information? Does the network tell it, hey, uh, you can ask for information about this network over here, or does it just, does it give a big chunk of information, or do we say, you know, you need to, you can ask for this information, but go over here to ask for it, and uh, which, you know, do we take, do we do it on the network level or a connection level or whatever? Um, I, I, I don't agree. know. We have a wide range. I, yeah. yeah, you, you I don't, need your point. It's I, good. Yeah, I don't I, think yeah. there's a correct answer to this. I don't think it should go in the charter. I think it should be one of the first discussions we have once chartered of Excellent. Thank at you. what point and how. Thank you. Uh, Daniel Khan Gilmore. So I think Mo made a really good um, point about that we need to understand the scope of whatever the shaper is connected to. And I think it's also interesting that that's in conflict a little bit with our idea that um, the on-pathness of the indicator will tell whether or not uh, it's appropriate for them to send these signals. So NAT is the big issue here. Um, so if the signal that's being sent here from the network to the device is gonna say anything about like a four tuple, we don't even know which four tuple it is applied to if we are sitting behind a NAT. So I think it's, in, it's critical that whatever discussion this has, we know what scope the shaper, the, the threatened shaper is, is attached to. But I also don't know how we square that with our, with our goal of just saying, well, if it's on path, we, you know, we can tell that they're legitimately marking the scope, right? Like device ID, most of the network doesn't know the device ID. and doesn't want to know the device ID. Good. All right, last comment, Hung Shing. We've got one question to ask people before we're done. So be brief. Yeah, Hung Shing from Huawei. I think it's very difficult for the network to send a random packet to a client, especially if it's behind an NAT device. I mean, what connection need to be in, uh, initiated by the client? I think this is some kind of pop sub uh, indication. So I think it's very difficult for, for the unsolidated uncertain, uh, approach to work. All right. Thanks. So um, we've heard a bunch of things here, but there's there's really a, a, a poll we'd like to, to take at this point in the last two minutes, um, which is, um, do you think that there is something in this space that we can come to some consensus about in terms of the problem statement that has been presented here? And uh, I will phrase this very simply in a show of hands. Uh, just to give a general sense of the room. Now, it may, not, it may not be that everyone agrees that how we should work on the problem is exactly the same way. I'm just talking about the, the general shape of this thing. And given that we are now, depending on which clock you look at, um, at time, uh, thank you all for 
attending. And uh, we'll be in touch. Zahed, do you want to say anything uh, at the mic at this point? Well, uh, yeah. Uh, so looking at the pool, I think there is some interest on like, well, we'd like to work on this, but definitely we have a lot of discussion on the charter. So we'll be working on charter. So uh, let's update the charter and let's start discussion on the uh, SAS city and mailing list, right? And then see like what, where it takes us. Yeah, and we've had a lot of constructive feedback during yes. the session, so I think there's a lot It, of it, it is feedback. really good. Thanks for doing this. I mean, it's really good. Thank you. Thank you, and see you on the list. <laughs>